Good afternoon, everyone. Hope all is well. So super excited. This is my first live ever with a Michelin star chef who is going to be joining me shortly. Uh, let me just send this over to Thomas. Here we go. Super. So, I mean, chef, right? It's always great for... Thomas. Hey, mate. How are you? Good, good. And yourself? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Very well indeed. You can see the excitement I have today. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first ever live with the Michelin star chef. So thank you so much for taking your time out and coming on here, sharing that knowledge, positivity with the world out here today. So great to have you on board. Brilliant. No, I'm glad to be here. It's, been, uh, it's going to be good fun. I'm looking forward to it. Super. So before we move forward, Thomas, if you can introduce yourself as to who you are and what you do so that we can take the conversation forward. Okay. So um, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Chef Thomas Elibar. Um I've been a chef now for uh, 10 years. Um, I've worked in multiple aspects of the industry from Michelin star to fine dining to private chef work. Um, I claimed awards and accolades along the way, opened my own consultancy firm, luxury catering brands. Um, and yeah, we're now um, probably our businesses in the Middle East and our entities over there. Um, we're the third largest uh, hospitality provider for franchise systems in group restaurants and establishments. Um, wow. And we're the number one consultancy firm um, in the Middle East, GCSE and KSA. Wow. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for coming on here. I mean, I know for sure this is going to be an exciting, exciting live uh, to have. So, Thomas, you mentioned that you're in this industry. You've been in this industry for 10 years. I read a bit about you. You started uh, cooking at the age of 17 in, in, in restaurants and all that kind of stuff. You know, as growing up, I mean, I ask this to all my guests that come on here. I mean... When we're growing up as, as college going, school going kids or university, we always think about, as, uh, you know, becoming a lawyer, a doctor, uh, an architect, an engineer. I mean, was being becoming a chef for you that aspiration from that very young age or you built it up over time? You know, I mean. No, I think so. Um, I think it's always been um, it's been quite a quite a big aspiration to, to, to always be a chef. Um, I've always loved and enjoyed cooking, cooking with friends, family, um, growing up over the years from a, from a small age, cooking with my mother, grandparents, stuff like that. So I was just going to ask you that question. Yeah, Were you the been... guy who used to join her, his mother in the kitchen every time to learn and experience that? I mean, that's what possibly grew you into what you are today. Oh, massively. Yeah, massively. Um, I had a lot of opportunities on the way that um, I sort of, sort of grasped with both hands and, and, and took full extent of those opportunities to to make it to where we are um, today. And I think over the years, it's been, there's been a lot of ups and downs. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of bad times, um, but there's also been a, a, a vast amount of good times. So there is no, been... there is no success without, without. No, exactly. Experiencing as, as, you times, know, you know? as you know, as you know, yeah. You, you have to fall like as a kid, right? Before you even start walking, you have to crawl. Yeah, of course. And crawling, you fall. Exactly. You start walking, you fall. You exactly. start running, you fall. You start riding your bike, you fall. You yeah. know, so all those things in life teach you a lesson that there is no success until you've fallen down and you oh, get massively. up and, and, and start again. So when was it the first time that you got into the kitchen professionally and started with your walk in one hand and the, what do you call it? <laughs> <laughs> the 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 spatulas in the, the other. spatula in the other hand. <laughs> what was when when did you go on and join into that industry? Um, so it started. So I the first restaurant I ever worked. In, I was fifteen. Um, okay. From um, was a was an actual first was first job. Um, was it, it was legal? Little, yeah, yeah. It was in, uh, <laughs> a, a little a little gastro pub. Um, okay. And um, yeah, no, it was it, it was brilliant. It, it taught me a lot about. Um, sort of just home cooking and, and, and making things from scratch and things like that. Um, and then I went off to college. I went off to, uh, to America, to the Culinary Institute of America, um, and sort of explored their methodology and, and, and practices. 
um, and then came back and, and was headhunted to go and work um, straight into Michelin Star, straight out of college. Um, and so, then, no, so no master chef, no, nothing no, at all, no. and you joined. Straight, I mean, yeah, <laughs> straight, straight into the straight into the deep end. Um, wow, and yeah, that was, so that which was one was your work. which one was your first Michelin Star restaurant that you uh, that's started? The first at? Michelin Star restaurant I worked in was um, for Pollen Street Social for Jason Atherton. Okay. Um, so I worked for Jason for a couple of years, um, had an absolutely amazing time, um, was incredible to, to sort of learn from him and, and, and be around in the environment that, that was just this amazing chef who's a great inspiration and, and took inspiration in everything around him and, and the people around him as well. Um, and it was a massive learning curve. It was, it was absolutely fantastic. It was probably one of the, the, the greatest, um, places I've, I've worked that I've, I still, um, hold a lot of fond memories of and a lot of good times working in the kitchen and then sort of Jason would just come up behind you and, and sort of look at what you're doing and like, what are you doing? And, and you sort of, uh, <laughs> a little bit like rub it in the headlights uh, for the first time. But um, yeah, I was uh, I was 17 when, when I went into to Mission of the Stars. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, so it was quite, um, quite a big step from sort of hotel cooking, gastro pubs and, and sort of that sort of refinement. Um, take sorry, going into that sort of refinement was a, was a very very big adjustment. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong out here, but is being a chef the definition of being patient? Um, I think uh, there's I think to Michelin to, star. In in order to be a Michelin star chef, you have to you have to have patience. Like you you have to be patient with ingredients. You have to be patient with recipes and and, and methodologies and practices. You have to be patient with those that are in your teams around you, um, you and, and I think patience is, uh, is, is probably one of the, the biggest foundations that, um, that a chef has to have. Um, and I think to, to, to try and be a chef without having patience, I think you're, you're setting yourself up to fail very quickly from, from the get-go. Fire in the kitchen, right? <laughs> yeah, honestly. Yeah, uh... <laughs> I mean, my wife is an absolute, uh, she is, um, what do you call it? She is so fascinated with MasterChef because yeah. from what they cook, I mean, it'd be celebrity MasterChef or normal MasterChef, whatever it is. Yeah. And, and sometimes I also join her in seeing those shows. I mean, what they're cooking and, and how they cook. I mean, I see the patience that these guys have. I mean, for me, patience is like, you know, when you have that um, a dessert or something. Yeah. And they and they're picking up uh, uh picking up small Things items with tweezers with, with and tweezers. stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, seriously, <laughs> come on. Like but it shows how much you have to put in to put one dish on the plate so that you know, especially in Michelin star uh, restaurants, I've seen it like it, it is so intense, especially in the kitchen and on uh on the restaurant table as well. It is so like if 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 a uh, if a uh, diner is not happy with your uh, with your dish, it can come back to you, come back on you and ruin and tarnish the, the the restaurant's image. Don't you think so? I mean, in that sense. Yeah, of course. And and I think the people say that it's if you have one bad aspect, it's coverable with with the rest of it being um, like sort of spot on. And and it's not true in the slightest. Like if you. If you're going to a restaurant that um, that holds itself in instead of perfection, um, and and the, the the level of service and the level of food that you're going to enjoy, um, if you don't have that nailed to a T from the get-go, then people aren't going to have that memorable experience that you want the guests to enjoy. You're not going to be able to find that balance between um, sort of the the perfect service, the perfect food, um, and and the perfect in, in environment to enjoy it. Um, so I think it's it's from the get-go you have to be extremely good. But it's also the consistency across the entire meal and throughout. So from the, the minute the guest walks in through from how they're, they're greeted, how they're introduced to their table, if they're into a waiting area, what's the atmosphere like? What are you offering them? Um, and then going to the table, having the chairs pulled out for them. And it's the little touches that, that make people feel um, feel sort of like they're, they're there and enjoying the purpose of being there for, for a, a magical experience. Um, and Absolutely. it has to be across with the food in the presentation. It has to be all the way through to the end, the wine choices, the drinks, what you're, what you're serving and how you're serving as well. It's, it's all comes down to play for when, when you're in sort of that level. 
as a Michelin star chef, I've got to ask you this question, right? I mean, why are Michelin star dishes so small? I mean, Sorry. a guy like me, I would have to order three <laughs> courses, three full courses, to yeah. fill myself up. Why are they so small? So I think that I, you know what, it, it's, it's funny you should mention this because on Instagram um, a couple of days ago, I posted a, a picture of a lamb and peas dish. Um, and it received um, a fair amount of negativity um, on the, the portion size and people saying, like, oh, I wouldn't pay more than two pounds for it. And um, where's the rest yeah, of it and stuff yeah. like that. And the thing that you, you have to try and explain to people is that when you when you go to a restaurant and you're, you're going to be sort of eating four, maybe more courses. Do you know what I mean? You're, you're going to have um, like you, when you arrive, you're, you maybe you're going to have like some some little canapes or like little mousse bouches and stuff like this. Um, so and they're there to to like entice all the palate senses. So you're going to have like a lot of richness. You're going to have a lot of creaminess, a lot of fatness, a lot of acidity, um, a lot of sort of umami. And you're going to enjoy all of these textures in a dish. So you're going to have the crunch, the the softness, the creaminess, the thickness, and and all of these sort of things that come together. And I think when you have four courses and you eat one after the other four courses in sort of the space of a couple of hours, and you you have to refine that balance of not having too much on the plate so that when people, when a guest is going to eat it, they're going to remember the dish for each individual component that, that balance and harmonize together. Whereas if you're going to have sort of a lot of it, you're, you're going to lose the, maybe the individual components and their, their actual aspects of flavor and their profiling. And when you get to dessert, um, a lot of desserts are very rich. They're like, if, especially if you order a chocolate dessert, like I've got a terrible sweet tooth. Um, and I actually love chocolate <laughs> desserts. I love chocolate. Um, and when I when I order a chocolate dessert, the, the chocolate and the dish is very rich. It's very heavy, so that it's a lot of a, it's a lot more of a smaller portion in in comparison to most um, to sort of most dishes in in sort of a standardised restaurant. Um, but that's because you okay. you don't want to overpower it and end up feeling then bloated, or you don't want to feel then that you've eaten too much richness and you're and you get that sort of sick feeling. And obviously, you don't want your guests to enjoy that if they're paying a lot of money to be in, in a fine dining environment and, and have a Michelin experience. So coming to a Michelin star restaurant is all about the experience that you would have in tasting the variety of individual ingredients within your plate. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. So you're going you're gonna to come to the restaurant and you're going to experience... Um, the the individual elements you're going to see how that the chefs have, have put their craft and their skills to the test to to make a dish that's perfectly balanced and and the flavor profiling is absolutely identical across the board where everything harmonizes and sings together on the plate so you're actually enhancing the natural flavor of all those other ingredients by pairing it with certain choices um, and then when people are going to eat that they're going to then say well okay that was brilliant like how did you get like lamb to taste that good for example do you know what i mean and people are going to then yeah. say okay how do i then do that at home and that's where a lot of people then want to then be sort of okay great like i now want to learn how to do this and that's where a lot of inspiration and influence comes from especially from chefs if you dine out in in michelin start experience and you eat something you think i want to know how they did that i want to i want to bring that to my own restaurant i want to bring that to my own dishes and to my own food that i'm serving do you do you do you always have this like you have a different chef coming to your restaurant to just try it out, see what's there, and then possibly copy you and take it to their restaurant? Um, I, I think there's there's sort of like um, uh, a bit of an unwritten rule between between sort of chefs at, at at certain levels that you can you can go to a restaurant and you can experience something and you can put the flavors of something together that are absolutely identical. But yeah. they're also not identical because of the way that you play in your own styling, the way that you're cooking the ingredients, um, your preparation methods and stuff like this. So when you then put them all together, you're then going to have something of that course. is exactly the same dish if you look at the ingredients list, but is then also completely yeah. different when you taste the two next to each other. And, and, and there is no such thing as a patent in restaurants, right? It's not <laughs> anyone can no, copy and take it. I mean, I mean, if you you can anyone anyone can look at a dish and take it and say, okay, I'm going to go and recreate this. Um, but to be honest, a lot of people just put their own spin on it. Um, so people have their own. Have you ever been? Have you ever, have you ever been copied and found out you've been to that restaurant? They're like, hold on a second, that's my dish. 
Um, I've seen it, I've seen a couple of um, a couple of examples um, in desserts more than anything um, of people sort of looking at things and and you sort of looking and think yeah okay I did this a while ago but is that when you see um, a picture of something that you've made and and you've posted on on Instagram and stuff like that um, yeah. or you post it somewhere else and then someone then says they, they then copy that and they post it on their Instagram and try and take credit for it. That happens probably a lot of times. It, it does happen a lot in the industry. Um, to, um, does, that, does that sort of excite you in any way? Like, like why are they doing this? Why can't they be original? I mean, as an agent, as a property agent, I get this sometimes, right? Like I've had an instruction of a property and someone's gone behind my back and spoken to the owner and got the property instructions because I possibly posted that on Instagram. They found out the details, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. So does that sort of excite you? Because sometimes I do like, I'm like, why wouldn't they just come to me instead of yeah. doing yeah. it? Yeah, it, uh, it does make you sort of, it, it, it does make you sort of think, oh, okay, like brilliant. Someone's, it's like, it's, I don't think it normally excites people. I think people more get, annoyed about it that you'd of rather course. like people just send you a message if you say or say like can you give me the recipe for this or can you give me the ingredients for this but yeah. when people actually just take the exact same photo of your dish and then try and pass it off it's um yeah it's, it's quite sort of it's, it's quite frustrating because a lot of work goes into every dish that you make so it's not something that's just like a, a five minute process do you know what i mean it's something that, that takes refinement it takes probably between like two to, to seven days to, to make a dish from start to finish, taste it, cook it, change wow. it, refine it. It's not just one of the things that's done instantaneously. So it's, it's, an, it's an experiment that you take over time and then yeah, you yeah, bring it course. on that table. Wow. Mm. Um, as an Asian, as a Muslim Asian from Pakistan, yeah. what I don't understand with a lot of Michelin star restaurants is why isn't there a halal section in there? I mean, when I go to a Michelin star restaurant, I have to deal with vegetarian. Yeah. Because the chicken or the lamb or the beef is not halal. So for me to enjoy that, you know, because I, I love meat. I, I really love my lamb and I really love the beef. Why aren't there more halal options in these restaurants? I think um, a, a lot of it comes down to um, the the actual quality of the the meat itself. Do you know what I mean? That a lot of restaurants will will strive to have um, sort of like wagyu beef and and things like that on their menu. Okay. They they try to have yeah. Um, and the um, the the whole sort of concept of it behind it is that if you if you can match the quality that they're looking for and that they want. Then things can be like done in with with preparation. It gets to the point of, um, say, like you're looking for a specific cut of beef that is, uh, like, um, what's the word? It's it's specific to um, a certain animal or a certain region okay. or a certain country. Gotcha. Um, those things don't always come um, with the availability to have halal preparations. So okay. when you go to a restaurant, as you said, you're, you 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 eat something that's that you're looking for something on the menu that's ha that's been prepared halal and you want to eat it. Um, it's very difficult to find the same quality you get in what you're looking for to have that specific element in a dish. Do you know what I mean? Okay, got you. I mean, let's say this is my. I'm I'm going to move on to what you do in hospitality after this question. But let's say I came to your restaurant. Yep. Now you know me. Yep. What is it would you serve? Um, so uh, definitely... Three, um, three courses. Three, uh, yeah, definitely three courses. Yeah. Dessert. Yeah, so we'd, um, we'd start probably um, with uh, a, a really nice sort of smoked um, halal chicken roulette. Um, so we'd go uh, with some nice uh, sort of sourdough croots with some salt, some olive oil, a nice bit of jasmine maybe just to... Just to, to lift it up a little bit and, and add a little bit of um, comparison, um, some little balsamic pickled shallots and stuff like this. Okay. Um, and then for the main course, we'd move on um, and we'd look again either to go um, probably down the road of, um, we, we cook with a lot of fish depending on the seasonality. 
Okay. Um, so we'd have probably uh, a nice, um, a nice like pan seared halibut with some pom mousseline, some uh, confit lemons, um, a little bit of sea vegetables, um, a sort of a lemon and champagne beurre blanc, um, and then we'd round off with um, a nice rich, um, like bitter chocolate dessert. So whether maybe like a, a chocolate parfait for the the time of year we're in now. Okay. Um, and we'd sort of do some macerated cherries, um, a little bit of uh, uh, fermented ginger. Um, just to really lift the chocolate and the, and the vibrancy of the dish. And how much would that set me back? Um, so, <laughs> if you, <laughs> so if you if you came and you had um, three courses, you're for for two people. You're looking at between sort of a hundred to one hundred and fifty pounds. Um, so you, it's it's a lot of people have a misconception that Michelin star is is expensive because it's Michelin star. It's yeah. not expensive because it's Michelin star. It's expensive because of the ingredients you're eating and the Absolutely. preparation to the make. Detail. The detail. Of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, exactly. Like I see Master Chef sometimes, and the attention to detail that even though maybe they're not the uh, Master Chef professionals, but they are just normal people that that want to become a Master Chef. Yeah. You know, and the attention to detail that they put in cooking or you know, like I said, picking up a gold-plated, uh, you know and with the tweezer and putting it on there you know all that kind of stuff so much attention to detail but thank you so much for sharing all that with me now yes, you're welcome. what made you decide to move into upscaling your business into hospitality and catering was that a, a business mind frame that you looked at an entrepreneur mindset or were you like you know i think it's enough of the chef what i've done it's now moving up in life in terms of building up that business? What was it that inspired you? I think you the, 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 the whole aspect is that the, the, the business portfolio and the business plan and model came from um, having sort of uh, like an outlook to, to sort of offer something that wasn't already in the market. Okay. Um, so a lot of people do consultancy. They do sort of little bits on the side and stuff like that. But we wanted to be um, a consultancy firm that went above and beyond. Do you know what I mean? So we knew from... Gotcha. Um, so we cover everything. So if someone approaches us, say you, you came to us and you said, uh, Thomas, I bought a site. Um, this is the size of the site. This is the idea I have in my head. How do I take this from paper and make it a possibility? Um, we then run through menus. We go through branding with you. We go through color schemes, designs, restaurant construction, uh, building equipment, everything that you would need to get it operational and to be serving. And the food. chefs and the head chefs. Exactly. We, we would do the, the recruitment, the training, everything okay. across the board, um, which is what we've done in, in nearly, I think, 47 different um, establishments now across wow. the Middle East um, and GCSE and KSA. And we, wow. we've, we operate on, as I mentioned earlier, some franchise systems as well. So, we have over uh, 60 different franchises now as well for the business. Wow. Um, and it expands yearly. Like we have more and more that, that come into it every year. More and more people say, I want to do this. And a lot more people want to invest and, and get involved in restaurants and, and things like whether they're a group of people, whether they're um, a sole investor and stuff like that. And they come to us and say, I've got an idea. How do I make it work? And that's how is we there, offer the difference. Is there a huge demand for the Michelin star restaurants up in the GCC? Do you feel um, that there is So that... I think there's, there in, in countries um, uh, along the lines of sort of um, from Dubai, Lebanon, um, even now Qatar, Kuwait as well, um, a lot of them are, are becoming more and more uh, popular to have that sort of refinement. Because they, and come, that extra they level. come to England to eat, the, uh, when they eat that, they want to take it back to exactly. their uh, countries and, and provide that uh, fine dining experience. Yeah, for 100%. The yeah, exactly. And now, like in, in Lebanon now, we have, um, so two two of the restaurants we um, we have are now uh, Michelin starred. Um, and we have another three that we're hoping to push for, for the first star. One that we're hoping okay. to push for a second star. Okay. Um, and I think the, the a lot of people in the societies and dynamics are, are coming together to say, actually, okay, this is what we want to try. This is what we want to do. And we want to have this option to have a restaurant that, is Michelin star that is fine dining that is the refined culinary journey and, and experience all rolled into one that we can go and have but we don't have to get on a plane to go and have it do you know what I mean okay. so a lot That's of people it. now want that to be in their hometowns or, or in their cities or sort of like an hour's drive but we have some guests that come to the restaurant and they're driving like two three hours just to come for wow. dinner 
and they right. come twice a week and you think like it's that's when you know what you're doing is what people want to want to be experiencing you know what i mean of course of course as i come from pakistan we're not that far away from the middle east no, have you had course. anyone approaching you yet about michelin star openings um, or fine so, dining openings in pakistan not yet we haven't um india I've, for example india has been um sort of one that's that's very predominantly growing more and more obviously they had their culinary olympics last year um yep. and they have their um their their new chef competitions that are coming up as well um Master chef india exactly um and i think marco pia white's been out there recently as well doing um some bits with their chef competitions and for their sort of like hospitality expos and festivals um and i think it's it's becoming a very very predominant um region to be sort of looking at for an investment and to to say okay this is now up and coming how can we get involved in this how can we expand the business and grow so we can go over there and say okay this is what we offer this is our uh, portfolio of what we've done before is this something that you'd be interested in this is what we'd like to do for you this is how we can make it happen in 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 india for you so i think it's something that is definitely on the table for us and it's definitely um probably going to be within the next couple of years i think Um, you might have to you might have to increase your portions though yeah that's <laughs> it <laughs> cuz you know i mean I, i don't know about the gcc but these guys we are told i mean in the gcc the way they're raised they can have a leg of lamb easy yeah exactly exactly and i think the 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 difference is if you can find the the balance and the concept that meets with what people's expectations are and what their past experiences are then i think you're you're sort of you you you're on to something very very uh big to get onto like sort of a concept and and to say okay this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to achieve it and you sort of you see people saying right okay this is what people are used to this is what people are going to expect how do you find the balance in between the two that plays into what we can do and offer in keeping with our own standards and our own sort of experience and what we do now um but also finding the balance between what they expect and what they've experienced previously on one of your blogs i i read that you also cater for the royal families and, yeah that's and, correct uh, and uh, ultra high net worth families how is it catering for the royal family i mean have you catered for the royal family just in the uk or worldwide as well um so uh due to um non disclosure agreements yeah okay. confidence I, i can't specify which royal families um okay. but there has been multiple royal families from different countries around the world um that have dined in the uk that we've been on site personal private chefs for right. um and the same with ultra high net worth individuals as well and and ultra high net worth families we um done private events for them we've done private uh, personal on site chefs um was that like your them. was that like your final achievement tick list in your in your spreadsheet of tick lists that you wanted to achieve um i think um i think it's always exciting working for working for sort of royal royal families and and politicians and and high net worth individuals and you think of course um it it's exciting it is really exciting it's a completely sort of different ball game to what you're used to um whereas before a lot of in restaurant scenes a lot of it's all about costings and how you can sort of meet your your margins and targets and budgets and things whereas you go into that sort of yeah, environment you and there is slash out yeah there is <laughs> there is no budget um there is no there's no costing there's no budget um yeah and it's 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 incredible um and it is really it is really really incredible but i remember i worked for for one family um and the the guy used to order uh once a week three 10,000 pound pots of caviar he'd have um a teaspoon out of each one um and then he'd give it back to me and say you can do whatever you want with this i don't want it now it's had a teaspoon out of it um and normally they get thrown away um but yeah it's something that you then have to find the balance with as well in your in your own mindset because especially with my own experiences i've been to to india i've been to africa i've seen um a, a lot of, especially in gcc as well a lot of sort of poverty places a lot of people that are, 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 are up and down the scale from the top of to the course. bottom um and when you see the level of of wastage and the sort of just a disregard for for what can be used in other other ways it's very it's very hard to get your head around that mindset to be honest um it's something that you have to sort of find within yourself to say 
Yeah, it's a completely different environment. Just turn, and just, just, sort of, just turn, just turn yeah. a blind eye towards it, right? Yeah, and it is, it's very difficult to do that. And I think a lot of people, um, a lot of chefs especially, do struggle with that going into them environments. Some of them thrive because they're sort of, they've been held back with maybe some of their creativity in, in restaurant scenes where they can't have um, a, a dish that has uh, no, no sort of balance or no budget to it. It can yep, yep. be whatever it is. Um, so a lot of people thrive for that fact because they get to use things they maybe never used before and they get to use things that a lot of other people don't. Um, but I think a lot of chefs also, I've had a few chefs that um, that we've put into places um, and they've come to me and said, like, Look, I chef, I can't do it. Um, like, it's just not, I, I can't get my head around it. They're wasting this. Like, it's just, I can't do it. And it's, you, I think it's, a, it's how you adjust your own mindset and how you adjust your own sort of vision on it is whether it's going to work for you or not. And I think if you want it to work for you, you can always make things work. As you know, if you want to do something, you can go and do it. But of course, if you, if you can't change your own mindset to adjust to that, then it's probably not for you to be in that specific aspect of, of the hospitality industry. I mean, it's good you're talking about this mindset and, and the fact that you've got to turn a blind eye towards it. I mean, sometimes in my case as well, when people come up and they say, oh, I want to buy 100,000 property in London, you're like, you won't get one here. But then sometimes you get people who are coming to you and saying, we want to buy a 50 million pound property in London. You yeah. know? So all that kind of stuff, when you think that 50 million pound for a property where there are poor people around the world living without shelters, you know, yeah. you could give something back to them, but it's their life, it's their money, they've earned it. Let yeah, them do whatever course. with it. Yeah, and I, I, I'm a strong believer that actually like you can, like people have that sort of that mindset that they want to, it's their money, they can do what they want. And rightly so, they can do what they want with it and they can do exactly. it as they wish. But however, I'm in the, the opposite mindset where actually I think, do you know what, I've, if, if I've made it to be able to get there, I want to help other people achieve it. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? 100%. I want to motivate other people to help them get and achieve what I've achieved. If people have the right mindset or if people are struggling, you put an arm out and you help them along the way. Because for me, Absolutely. it's not about just having a race of, of, of life to get somewhere. It's about enjoying what you have around you and how you can share and give that back to other people. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're not, we're all not going to be here forever. Do you know what I mean? And, and we have in, to, we have to go, we have to go six feet under. We have to. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And um, the way I look at it is that the bigger impact you can have, not necessarily of what you can do for yourself or what people think you have, um, but what you can do for other people and what you can give to them is a lot more of a better way to, to sort of have a legacy to leave behind is what you can do for other people, what you can do to Absolutely. help them. Absolutely. And this is why I do, this is why I do these live sessions to give something people, to give back something to people, to give that motivation, share the knowledge like today, what you shared about yourself in terms of from where you were to where you are today. I mean, just cooking for the Royal families. It's absolutely amazing. It's an amazing achievement. And I, Congratulate you on that for, Thank for you. achieving that. Uh, two final questions I have for you. What's next in the Thomas Leather Barrel world uh -huh. of <laughs> hospitality, catering, restaurants, Michelin star? What is next? Um, so I think the, the, the next biggest thing for us is going to be, um, so the uh, online platform for our new website has just launched for Gourmet. Um, okay. So Gourmet is a luxury uh, catering brand. Okay. Um, so we do weddings, we do parties, uh, celebrations, events, but we also do um, sort of uh, cooking for the stars as what most people sort of like whittle it down to, um, where we will go um, on tour with sort of music acts and artists and things like that. Well, we'll cook okay, like bands at festivals. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got um, you. So we do stuff like that. We do big uh, events and food festivals. So I think for, for the next sort of couple of years is going to be really um, developing the brand, developing the business um, and expanding on the, the luxury side of the catering. Um, we, we're looking at doing a couple of food truck ideas as well. So we've got some new concepts on the go. Um, we're looking at food trucks in the UK, food trucks in Egypt, food trucks in sort of in Qatar as well, over by resorts and things like that. Gotcha. So there's, there's, there's a lot in the pipeline of what's, uh, of what's going on. Um, at the minute, we're in the process of developing uh, an, an app um, that basically is a, a one-time purchase app. 
Um, so you, you purchase the app from the App Store, the, the Play Store, whatever it is, um, and it's personalized to you. So basically, I hear a lot of people saying, um, oh, I don't know what to have for dinner tonight. I'm not sure what to get. I'm not sure how to do this. I um, get this question every single exactly, day from my Exactly. And the, and the worst bit is when you're sitting down for dinner and she's like, what should I cook tomorrow? I'm like, woman, I'm just having my dinner yeah, right exactly. now. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what to do. I can't yeah. think. <laughs> so basically, the app is designed so that um, the app itself can will contain um, over 50,000 recipes. Um, it's, so it's a, it's a very large scale project. Um, and basically, it's personalized to each individual user. So you can put things that um, you're allergic to, your preferences for disliking gotcha. and, and, so and things can, that you, you like. The, you can put the ingredients and according to that exactly and it will it will generate recipes for you that we think the 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 the, the system thinks that you're going to like and what you'd enjoy um then there's obviously also like a, a major search feature in there as well so you can search for practically any recipe that you want to cook from around the world a uh from a basic pastry dough from a like a, a simple bread dough or all the way up to a refined um three michelin star plate of food um, and it will give you the step-by-step -step instructions. Um, there's also um, a very advanced um, calculatory system built into the app as well. Um, and it's also yeah. so that you, you're going to take a recipe that you want, you put in it how many people you're cooking for, and it automatically calculates everything for you of how much you're going to need. Um, wow. If the recipe, if you're in a country where sort of you use a different measurement scale, so if you're using, say, cups in America or whatever, and the yeah, recipe is yeah. in grams, it will automatically transfer everything over to you for your design weight, uh, weights and measures that you're looking for and how you work. Um, and is it launching? So we're hoping to launch next year. Um, so yeah, so it's going to be um, it's going to be quite big. So it's going to be um, available in every country around the world. Um, it's going to wow. be available um, from Microsoft, from Google, from Android, from Apple. Um, so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a massive monumental task at the minute to sort of get it ready and things. Um, Look forward to it. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. Um, and I think also I want to sort of get back into doing a lot of work with sort of like colleges and and sort of the next generation. So um, there's a few bits going on with um, Hit Training Academy for the Chef gotcha. Apprentice Scheme. Um, kids so, and teenagers. Yeah, and... so we're looking at doing things like that for their apprentices. Um, so we're looking at new ways to do that. Um, and we're, we're probably going to approach a few um, Cajun colleges next year as well um, and see if there's some sort of events and bits we can do and, and, and get involved in. Absolutely. Before I go, two, I, I was supposed to ask two <laughs> questions, but I've got one more question. Looking at this lockdown right now, right? Yeah. Uh, hospitality, restaurant, bars, pubs, all that kind of stuff. How, I mean, we saw that restaurants were closed until the 4th of July and everything for the past three months. What has, what has it taught you and how are you going to take that experience on board for the next years to come in hospitality, the restaurant industry, the pub industry? How has that affected the whole industry going forward? I think um, I think it's massively affected the industry. Um, like there's no question about that. I think the the effect it has. Um, I don't think we've seen the full effect yet. Um, I think we're probably going to see um, the full effect over the next few months at least. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of Michelin star restaurants have shut, um, as you may have heard. Um, a lot of uh, normal restaurants have shut. A lot of businesses have closed, um, and it is it is a very difficult time for the industry. Um, but I think now having the opportunity where restaurants can reopen and bars can reopen. Um, I think what we need to do and what I beg of people to do is that not to go crazy on it and not to take advantage of it, but actually sort of just hold back a little bit and, and go yeah, at we it saw to that say, on the 4th of July. Exactly. Exactly. And, and you think that what the government will do is they'll literally shut everything again. But the thing is they'll shut pubs, but I'm hoping that they're going to keep the restaurants open because the work that a lot of people in the industry have gone into to, ensuring that their their restaurants have been scaled down in the number of covers they can do um the the size of their chef teams and the space that they have to work in um and all of the things that they're putting into into place and into practice so that it's safe for people to come into their restaurant and still enjoy that sort of little bit of normality to go out and have dinner with friends and family and and celebrate and stuff i think that if if we can keep it going now i think the the industry has a very very good chance to to sort of bounce back quite quickly um, I think that if it doesn't, if it if it gets to the point where 
we go back into lockdown and, and things are then having to shut again, um, I think it's going to have a dramatic effect. I think it's going to last for a lot longer. Um, but for me, what I want to say is that I want people to, to still enjoy going out, but I don't want people to be taken advantage of it. Like a lot of people like go out and they think, oh, I'm going to go out for dinner here. I'm going to go out to this place. I'm going to go out to that place. But what a lot of people don't understand is that these places are people's livelihoods. They're people's houses. They're people's mortgages and of things course. like that. And all of these things then come into play that actually if we can't operate and we can't open, I we're mean, not able Instagram to pay for stuff packed. like that. Yeah. My Instagram live story was packed with people as if COVID and lockdown didn't happen. Yeah, you know? exactly. It was like, I'm at Novikov, I'm at Sexy Fish, I'm at this, I'm at that, I'm in Mayfair, I'm at the Burke. Like, what the hell? What, yeah, like, every, everybody sort of went crazy. And I think that's what people need to understand as well, is that it is still here. Do you know what I mean? And as much as we want to go back to normality and want to get rid of it, but it is still here and it is a massive sort of task to try and maintain the industry and, and the hospitality sector and to keep people in jobs. And, and that's the, the main goal for, for a lot of businesses is to keep their employees on board and to keep their teams going so that we can reopen and we can get back to a normality where we're, we're operating, people are coming in, they're enjoying the food, they're having a good time, of but course. it's in a safe environment. And I think a lot of people don't really understand the full concept of the effect that it has at the minute, um, which is a shame to see. But I think for, for us going forward, I think it puts in place actually something like this can happen at any moment in time. Of course. Um, and I think a lot of people weren't, I don't think people really expected it to happen. Um, I don't think people really sort of thought that this is going to happen to us or it's going to happen in our lifetime or whatever, or whatever people may look at it. But I think that it has now happened. I think a lot of people now need to look at that fact to say, okay, things like this can happen. How do we prepare for this if it happens in the future? Whether it happens tomorrow, whether it happens five years down the line, we need to be prepared to say, okay, this is how we're going to maintain the industry. This is how we're going to maintain the infrastructure. And this is how we're going to keep the revenue stream going. Because at the end of the day, if it happens again, I don't think the industry is going to be as big as what it is if we can't sort of nip in the bud how to deal with it um, and the whole process behind actually keeping people employed and keeping people in jobs, keeping people training up. Is your hospitality in, uh, company consulting restaurants and businesses in this sector of how to go about taking those measures? Of course, we're, we're, we're looking at, obviously, we've got some projects that we started before um, the, the whole pandemic hit. We've got projects that we've started now during the pandemic as well. And we have to look at how we can carry on and offer the same service, but also maintain the guidelines and the rules that the governments and and, and laws are setting in place for us to, to abide by. Um, so it's something for us that we look at. Obviously, we have um, less tables in, in, and, and customers being able to sit in a certain space. Um, and we would then have, um, like, obviously, the chefs are, are, are social distancing as best they can. People are wearing masks inside the kitchen and stuff, which a kitchen's very hot anyway, as it is, especially in the summertime. And, yet, and, when you, you, and you still have to wear masks mask. and things. Yeah, exactly. So it's something that we are looking at that is the, the best sort of practice of what we can do. Um, but if, uh, for us, if, we, if there's something that we feel isn't going to work because of that, then we'll stop it, we'll draw a line under it, and we'll try and find another way around to, to succeed in the project, but to do it in the best possible manner for outcome for everybody. Super. Thomas, wow. It's been <laughs> an amazing, amazing live session. I learned so much about cooking, Michelin star, uh, why a Michelin star does not serve food, all that kind of stuff. I wish you all the best in life and for years to come in this restaurant, hospitality industry. But before you go, you shared, you shared a lot of positive advice with us today. But I do this with all my guests that come on here. What positive advice would you like to share with the world out there today in terms of taking that on board and moving forward in life? Guys, whatever whatever it is that you want to sort of achieve and what you want to do in your life, don't give up. Like, yes, you're going to have good days. Yes, you're going to have bad days. Focus on the bad days, not necessarily always focusing on the good days, because if you focus on the bad days, you're going to see why they were bad days, how you can improve and how you can make more good days. The bad days are there to give you an extra lesson in how to succeed and move forward with your dreams and what you want to do. And just keep pushing. Whatever happens, just keep going forward. If you think having a down day today you need to sort of get into that mindset to say okay 
I'm going to do this today. I'm going to do this. Get yourself into that routine to say, I can achieve whatever I want to achieve and nothing's going to stop me. And if you get to the point in your dream where something's going to say, okay, I can't do it this way, don't stop there. Look at another way to go around it. Look at a way to go over it, under it, any way you can to keep moving forward because your dreams are only ever going to succeed in your own mindset of how you're going to do it. Absolutely. Super. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been, Mitchell, pleasure it's been an absolute pleasure. Man. Absolute pleasure. I've had a great time. And I, I, I shall see you in your restaurant soon. Yes, 100%. You're welcome anytime. Super. Thank you, Thomas. Take care. Thank you so much. Cheers, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that was Thomas Leatherbarrow, who is a Michelin star chef. He spoke about so many things from where he started to where he is today, to working in a Michelin star kitchen, to working and catering for the royal families, ultra high net worth individual families, to opening up his hospitality business, consultancy business for restaurants in the UK, outside the UK, in the Middle East, GCC, around the world. What an amazing guy. What an amazing live session. Super. Thank you so much to Thomas for joining me. Raj, you're late today. Thank you to all the viewers for joining me. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Do tune in at three o'clock and six o'clock where I've got my two live sessions again for today. See you soon. Bye-bye.